I started recording this over the weekend during which Illinois enacted a shelter-in-place order as a response to the outbreak of COVID-19 novel coronavirus. All non-essential businesses are shut down. Many people have been voluntarily shuttered into their homes for almost two weeks, if not longer. I was thinking about a phrase that gets thrown around in response to negative events, which is, it's not the end of the world. You hear this phrase used in response to everything from COVID-19. You know, it's not the end of the world that there's a global pandemic, to things like finding out that the grocery store is out of the good ice cream flavor that you like. The thing I was thinking about, though, is that the psychological mechanism which gets us to it's not the end of the world is one which presupposes what it would be like if that event actually caused the world to end. For us to say it's not the end of the world, we have to imagine in some small, potential, or invisible way what it would be like for that event to be so devastating that it did actually cause the world to end. I was mulling this over, thinking about what kind of model I had for ends of worlds, whether they are our own or someone else's, personal or global in scale. And of course, because I'm a huge romantic sap, I was thinking about where I could find the most romantic models for the end of the world. To me, I found this in an author who was very dear to my heart, a 19th century French writer named Marcel Schwab. He's considered in some ways a precursor to the Surrealist movement, a prototype for surrealism, magical realism, historical fiction. Despite his incredible narrative powers, I don't feel that he's given his due in the world of writing. I think his writing is sublime on many levels, and one of those levels is his ability to conceive of the end of worlds, both global and personal. He's the kind of author who ushers in genesis and destruction in ways that have a tremendous gravity, a tremendous weight to something dying or being born. And I think he does this by looking at the subject directly and painting an incredibly expressive picture of that thing falling apart. Descriptions provide you with an explanation of the mechanisms of a thing's destruction, its downfall, whether it decayed, bled out, and exploded from within. I wanted to kind of give a few examples of Marcel Schwab's worlds, their respective beginnings and ends. I was hoping that this would be something to give us perspective at a time of tragedy, a time when people have to make a personal value judgment about their own mental and emotional yardstick for what the end of the world entails. Of course, in conceiving of those ends, also conceiving of new beginnings. This is a story called The Milesian Virgins. Suddenly, without a soul knowing why, the virgins of Miletus began to hang themselves. It was like a moral epidemic. Parting the doors of the Gynasea, one would knock into the still quaking feet of a white body suspended from the rafters. One was startled by a hoarse sigh and a tinkling of rings, bracelets, and anklets which rolled across the floor. The throats of the hanged lifted like the twitching wings of a bird being smothered. Their eyes appeared full of resignation rather than fear. The young girls would retire in the evening quietly as a deemed fit, having remained seated in modest outfits without holding their knees together. Toward the middle of the night, wails broke out, and at first one believed them oppressed by heavy thoughts, nightbirds of the brain. The parents would rise and check on them in their bedrooms. They expected to find them laid out on their bellies, hips shaking with fear, or arms crossed over their breasts with their fingers pressed over the place where the heart beats. But the beds of the young girls were empty. Then one heard swaying in the rooms above, and there, lit by moonlight, the white tunic tumbling, the hands dug into one another down to the fingers' low knuckles, they hanged and their swollen lips turned blue. At dawn, the house sparrows would alight on their shoulders, peck at them, and finding their skin cold, wing off with little chirps. Hardly had the morning's first breeze shivered through the veils stretched over the courtyards, when it carried from the friendly houses the mourner's grave song. And in the marketplace among the buyers of uncertain hours before the spare clouds were dyed pink, 
they recited the list of the night's dead. The heralds ran here and there. Like the others, the daughters of the magistrates and archons, hardly nubile on the eve of taking the yellow nuptial veil, were hanging themselves mysteriously. The men who came to the assembly, all marked by the red rope that betrays the late comers, neglected the people's affairs and wept openly into their hands. The trembling judges handed down sentence of exile and no longer dared condemn to death. They drove from the obscure valleys where the drug-peddling women dwelled, a great number of crones who turned their heads from the daylight. The women in makeup with heavy gates and eyes too blackened were banished from the city. Those who taught unknown doctrines beneath the porticos, the speechifiers to the young people, the priests promenading goddess icons upon beasts of burden, the initiates of mystery, and the lovers of Sibylle were regulated to beyond the city walls. They migrated to settle in the caverns dug into the rock of the neighboring mountains in time immemorial. They slept there in stone chambers, some of which served the prostitutes, others the philosophers, such that once twilight fell the young people of Miletus left the city to spend the night underground. And so on the hillsides, through the openings carved out of the mountain, one could see lights aglow by the first hours of vigil, and everything which in the city of Miletus had been strange or impure continued its life inside the earth. Then the archons of the colony made a decree by which a new manner of burial was ordained for the hanged young girls. They should be displayed to the populace, naked, the little rope around the neck and carried like this to their graves. And one was hoping that modesty by these means would vanquish voluntary death. When the night after this law's enactment, the Milesian virgin's secret was discovered. Priests who maintained a sacred hearth in the temple of Athena rose a bit before the middle of the night to add reeds to the fire and pour oil into the lamps. And they saw, moving forth through the obscurity of the central hall, a group of virgins who seemed to have been led there by a dream. For they made their way in shadow towards a certain slab of rock, near the altar, which was risen. A young boy, who customarily carried the goddess's baskets, veiled his head and entered the temple among the virgins. The vault was high, scarcely lit by a weakly luminous point at its summit. In the depths the wall looked dazzling, being made of a single metal mirror. At first this polished surface was nebulous, then a few fleeting images swept across it. It was a glaucous color, like the eyes of the owls consecrated to Pallas Athena. The first of the Milesian girls advanced towards the immense mirror, smiling and undressed. The veil attached at her shoulder fell, then the pleat of the breast, and the azure belt supporting her bosom. Her body appeared in its splendor, and she untied the braid of her hair which spread over her shoulders and down to her heels. The other girls beside her laughed, seeing her gaze upon herself. However, no image appeared in the metal mirror to those who were nearby, but the young girl, her eyes horribly dilated, sobbed the cry of a terror-stricken animal. She fled, and one heard the sound of her bare feet on the slabs of rock. Then, amid the dread of silence, some minutes having passed, the howl of the mourners resounded. And the second girl who gazed upon herself contemplated the smooth surface and let out the same moan over her nudity. And once she had climbed back out in her delirium, the distant plaints made it known again that she had hanged herself under the cold moonlight. The young boy placed himself directly behind the third girl, and his gaze followed the gaze of the Milesian, and the cries of horror burst from their lips at the same time. For the reflection in the sinister mirror was deformed in the natural way of things. Similar to herself in this mirror, the Milesian girl saw her forehead traversed by wrinkles, her eyelids clipped, the leucoma of old age upon her eyes weeping room, her ears softened, her cheeks in pockets, her nostrils reddened and full of whiskers, her chin greasy and cleft, her shoulders pitted, 
her breasts wilted and their buttons discolored, her guts spilling toward the floor, her thighs browning, her knees flattened, her legs marked by tendons, her feet swollen with corns. The image no longer had hair, and under her scalp ran opaque blue veins. Her straining hands appeared calloused, her nails the color of lead. Thus the mirror presented to the virgin Milesian the spectacle of what life held in store for her. And in the features of the reflection she found every hint of resemblance. The movement of her forehead and the line of her nose, and the arc of her mouth and the distance between her breasts, and the color of her eyes above all, which gave the impression a profound thought. Terrified by her body, ashamed of the future before knowing Aphrodite, she hanged herself from the rafters of the Ganesam. Now the young boy had pursued her and drove away the other virgins before him. But he arrived too late, and the Milesian's body was already wavy with agony. He laid her upon the ground, and before the mourner's arrival gently caressed her limbs and kissed her eyes. Such was this young boy's answer to the mirror of future truth to the mirror of Athena. There are so many ways we can organize writing as a form of communication into different spheres. We might have definitions like the length of a piece, whether or not there are style guidelines and editorial formalities, the media upon which the writing is supposed to be presented. Genre is another one of these spheres. I think you could have an endless discussion on genre in and of itself. I think one of the ways we neglect how writing as communication becomes organized is the extent to which words themselves are intrinsic to a piece as material data, or if the words are providing an inferral of meaning and an inferral of value. What I mean is that we might look at words and say, well, these words are integral to the piece I'm reading. It's information that's necessary to understand the writing in a technical way, but there are other words that are poetry. There are word choices which create poetic speech meant to influence or inform values which are extrinsic to the material data being described. Uh, at our most cynical, we could say that this type of writing is meant to manipulate, that these words are actually meant to twist or even obscure the meaning from the material data of the text. For some writing, we expect a level of objectivity that leaves no room for projected values. We try to monitor some areas of communication, like journalism or social media, very closely for this, calling out when something is presented as material data, but it's written to present an obvious value judgment. We want to cleave language that's flowery or emotional or from the bare bones technical data. And we could organize writing on a scale of most poetic to most factual, but individual people would organize the scale in very different ways. You might put stereo instructions on one end and a bodice ripper romance novel on the other, but ultimately, the words which we decide are material is a personal and subjective process. Someone might take that same bodice ripper romance novel and say that every single emotionally charged poetic word is absolutely material data on the same level as stereo instructions because they themselves require a level of veracity in what is being felt. They need the assumption of objectivity in their subjective information. It's easy to write this off as just being the difference between fiction and nonfiction, but I would assert that this goes much deeper than organizing it in that way. I think you might be surprised in discussions with other people you normally agree with if you were to talk about which details in a piece of writing were or weren't intrinsically important, which details were artistic flourishes and stylistic choices, even in very dry or scientific pieces of writing. We might also find that in talking about this difference between the essentials and non-essentials of writing, we start to learn more about the values we hold as individuals around communication. Do you have a friend who provides way too much detail in every story? That really bugs me, and I worry about doing that myself. In the quest to provide accuracy, I've actually provided unnecessary levels of detail. Accuracy and detail aren't the same thing in communication. <laughs> 
People who send a five-paragraph text message describing every painstaking detail when relaying an incident, I think, uh, is all of that really necessary? It sometimes feels like influence. What's the material element, and which words here are you saying for your benefit, not mine? This is a question that I'd encourage you to ask when you're reading something for leisure. Are there words which create a framework, and within that framework other words are there to add color within the lines, or is every word a piece of a material component, each word is a building block like a brick in a building? And without one or two of those word choices, it would be a fundamentally different story. Just think about it sometime when you're reading. One of the things I love about Marcel Schwab is that, and again, I think this is a personal value judgment, I find his writing to be laden with emotion and sentiment while being quite material, quite descriptive in terms of creating material data like sensory information, gesture, and what I previously referred to as weight, gravity. I think this is also indicative of a certain type of poetic prose which we don't see as much with the proliferation of genre writing. And again, this isn't to trash genre or to criticize it. We can have hundreds of important conversations about genre. Just to say that there is an interesting way of looking at communication, which is a key part of human experience, where we derive meaning from material data and we create a material world from subjective meaning. I wonder if when you're reading or listening to Marcel Schwab, you might have an inclination of what I'm saying. This one is simply titled The Plague. I, Buonacorso de Neri de Pitti, son of Buonacorso, gonfalonier of justice in the commune of Florence, of which the coat of arms was dressed in the year 1401 by an order of King Rupert, in the city of Trento with the golden rampant lion, want to recount for my ennobled descendants what befell me when I began to roam the land in search of adventure. In the year 1373, being a young man without money, I fled from Florence along the great highways, with Matteo for companion, for the plague was devastating the city. The sickness was swift and attacked in the streets. The eyes burned and grew red, the throat sore, the stomach distended. Then the mouth and tongue were covered by little pockets of irritating water. One was possessed by thirst. A dry cough shook the sick for several hours. Then the limbs went rigid at the joints. The skin piebald with swollen red pox, which some have dubbed buboes. And, in the end, the faces of the dead were distended and whitish, with bleeding contusions and mouth open like trumpets. The public fountains, nearly dried up from the heat, were surrounded by men hunched and gaunt who tried to dunk their heads. Many plunged straight in, and those were pulled out by chain hook, black with scum, their skulls crushed. The browning corpses littered the middle of the lanes down which stream in season, torrents of rain. The smell was intolerable and the fear was terrible. But Matteo loved to roll the dice, so we had quite a time there at the exit of the city. And we drank, at the first inn, some mixed wine to our health and mortality. Merchants were there from Genoa and Pavia, and we challenged them with dice cup in hand, and Matteo won twelve ducats. As for me, I invited them to a game of tables, and had the good fortune of walking away with a gain of twenty gold florins, with which ducats and florins we purchased mules and a load of wool and Matteo, who had deliberated travelling to Prussia, picked up a provision of saffron. We roamed the paths from Padua to Verona, we came back to Padua to furnish ourselves more amply with wool, and we travelled all the way to Venice. From there, passing the sea, we went on into Slavonia, and visited the good cities up to the Croatian border. In Buda I took sick with fever, and Matteo left me alone at the inn with twelve ducats, returning to Florence, where a certain business was calling him and where I was to join him again. I lay in a dry and dusty room, on a bag of straw with no doctor but a door that gave on to the drinking room. On St. Martin's night there arrived a company of fifers and flautists, and some fifteen or sixteen Venetian and Teuton soldiers. After draining many a flask, Crushing the pewter steins and breaking the jugs against the wall, they began to dance to the sound of the fife. 
They peeked their ugly red mugs through the door and seeing me laid out on my back, started to pull me into the other room, crying, you drink or you sink, then swindled me while the fever pounded on in my head and finished by dumping me in the sack of straw, the opening of which they stitched shut around my neck. I sweated copiously, and this no doubt lowered my temperature. Where is my anger sword? They had tangled up my arms and taken away my sword, otherwise I would have made a break for it, thorny with straw through the soldiers. But on my belt I carried under my stockings a short and sheathed blade. I succeeded in slipping my hand to it, and with its help I slid open the fabric of the sack. Perhaps the fever was still causing my brain to swell, but the memory of the plague we had left in Florence, and which had since spread to Slavonia, mixed in my mind with the sort of idea I had formed of the face of Sulla, dictator of the Latins, of whom the great Cicero speaks. He resembled, the Athenian said, a blackberry covered with flour. I resolved to terrify the Venetian and Teuton gendarmes. And when I found myself in the nook where the innkeeper locked up his provisions and conserved fruits, I quickly slashed a bag full of corn flour. I rubbed my face with this dust, and once I had taken on a complexion neither yellow nor white, with my blade I gave my arm a good scratch, from which I drew enough blood to unevenly blot the coating. Then I got back into the sack and I waited for the drunken reprobates. They came in laughing and staggering. No sooner had they seen my white and bloody face that they crashed into each other, crying, The plague! The plague! I hadn't even gathered my weapons before the inn was empty. Feeling recovered from the sweat these ruffians had forced on me, I set out on the road for Florence to join back up with Matteo. I found my companion Matteo wandering the Florentine countryside and quite under the weather. He hadn't dared go into the city for the plague that continued to rage there. We turned back and made our way on a quest for riches towards the states of Pope Gregory. Heading up towards Avignon, we encountered a band of armed men carrying lances, pikes and bulges, for the citizens of Bologna had just risen up against the Pope by request of those in Florence, which we didn't know. We played joyous games of this and that sort with the people there, as many games of tables and as of dice, so well that we won upwards of three hundred ducats and four score gold florins. The city of Bologna was almost entirely devoid of people, and we were received in the bathhouses with cries of jubilation. The chambers there are not covered with straws in many Lombard cities, and the filthy beds are not lacking there, though the straps are for the most part broken. Matteo ran into a Florentine girl he knew, Mona Giovona. As for me, who didn't think of asking the name of my girl, I was happy enough with her. We drank in abundance there, of chewy wine from the region and of bitter beer, and we ate jams and tartlets. Matteo, whom I had told of my adventure, feigning to step out, went down into the kitchen and came back disguised as a plague victim. The sauna girls fled on all sides, letting out high-pitched squeals, then gathered their wits and came, still petrified, to touch Matteo's face. Mona Giovona did not want to go back with him, and stayed trembling in a corner, claiming his forehead was warm with fever. Meanwhile, Matteo, drunk, lay his head down among the pots right there on the table, which his snores were causing to shake, and he looked like one of those colorful wooden faces street performers show on the sidewalk stage. At last we left Bologna, and after diverse adventures, we arrived near Avignon, where we learned the Pope was imprisoning all the Florentines and burning them, and them in their books, to take vengeance for their rebellion. But we were alerted too late, for the sergeants of the Pope's marshal took us by surprise in the night and threw us in the prison of Avignon. Before our interrogation, we were examined by a judge and provisionally put in the oubliette until the preliminary investigation with dry bread and water, as is customary in ecclesiastical justice. I nevertheless succeeded in hiding under my robe our burlap sack, which contained a bit of polenta and some olives. The floor of the dungeon was swampy, and we had no air save through a grilled window that opened out to the level of the courtyard's ground. Our feet had been yoked into the holes of very heavy wooden stocks, our hands bound to fairly loose chains such that our bodies touched from the knee up to the shoulder. The dungeon bailiff did us the kindness of telling us that we were under suspicion of poison, 
for the Pope had ascertained through certain ambassadors that the Gonfalonieres of the Commune of Florence were entertaining a plot for his death. We were thus in the pitch blackness of the prison, hearing no noise, unsure of the hour of day or night, and in grave danger of being burned alive. I remembered then our strategy, and the idea came to us that papal justice, by fear of our illness, would have us thrown outside. Painstakingly, I managed to get my polenta, and it was agreed that Matteo would smear his face with it and blotch his own with blood, while I cried out to draw in the lackeys. Matteo made up his mask, and the raspy howls began, as if his throat were constricted. I invoked Our Lady, rattling my chains. But the dungeon was deep, the door thick, and it was night. For several hours we pleaded to no avail. I ceased my cries. Matteo, however, continued to moan. I nudged him with my elbow that he might rest until the morning. His moans only grew louder. I touched him in the darkness. My hands felt nothing but his belly, which seemed swollen to me like a goat's skin. And as he cried in a hoarse voice, A drink! A drink! Until it seemed I was listening to the desperate calls of a loosed dog pack. The pale disk of the rising daylight tumbled in through the little window. And then a cold sweat streamed down my limbs. For under his powdery mask, under the blotches of dried blood, I saw that Matteo was deathly pale, and I recognized the white scabs and the red oozing of the Florentine plague. In philosophy, there's a concept known as uh, the hyperobject, and I'm not going to do a tremendous amount of service to the description, but in a very, very general lay term, a hyperobject is something that we as individuals can't perceive the entirety of simply from where we're standing. We can't, from whatever position we're in as an individual, see the entirety of that object. Uh, and it could be a phenomenon, it could be an actual physical object, like a mountain. Uh, we can't see the entirety of that thing from our fixed perspective. Just like we can cleave writing between the material words and the intrinsic detail of those words, and the inferral of the words, the, the inferral of meaning or value, another way that we might look at situations, catastrophic or good situations, but in this case, right, we're talking about catastrophes, we're talking about the ends of worlds, uh, a way we might cleave those is between the ends of worlds which are greater than us, worlds which we are acknowledging we can't see the entirety of from our perspective and the ending of worlds which are entirely personal that in a way the world ending has a personal value for us which cannot be exchanged to any other individual um, it's different than the world ending as a hyper object or as any any number of of hyper objects. So I, I wonder if there's a chance for us to reframe the ending of a world, and I say our world, right? Not the world in totality, because sometimes multiple worlds have to end for something to really, really end. You might say, well, there's the end of my job, but it's not the end of your career. You go on to get a new job or, well, there's the end of our relationship, but your relationship changes. You, you know, you wind up going, oh God, I'm still dating this person, but it's actually not that bad. It's that world ending event ended a kind of reality, which was never fixed in the first place. Um, and whatever happens to us as people, we have ultimately to decide whether or not there's a kind of solipsism in us uh, letting the other worlds fade away, letting the reality beyond us fade away. Or, consequently, before we've ever faded away, 
giving the world its due and giving everything outside of ourselves that level of, of value. I find that sometimes people give the outside world that level of value that they would never, ever dare give to themselves. And then in other cases, we wind up eschewing the outside world, even things we can verify completely. We just ignore them. We take them out of the equation because the end of the world is so important to us. Um, a good way to think about this is I've never heard someone say, well, it's only the end of the world. The final thrust of faith which had swept the world was unable to save it. New prophets had arisen in vain. The mysteries of the will were expounded to no end. It was no longer a question of controlling it, but rather its quantity seemed simply to diminish. The energy of all living things dissipated. It had been gathered in one supreme effort towards a future religion, and that effort had failed. All withdrew into a very gentle selfishness. Every passion was tolerated. The world was as if in a hot lull. Vices bred there with the frenzy of great poisonous plants. Immorality became the very law of things, with chance as their god. Science obscured by mystical superstition, the tartuffery of the heart which the senses serve as tentacles, the seasons once distinct, now mixed together in a series of rainy days which incubated the storm, nothing precise nor traditional, but a disarray of old-fashioned things and the reign of the vague. It was at that point when, through an electric night, the omen of devastation appeared to fall from the sky. A heretofore unseen tempest blew on high, engendered by the earth's corruption. The cold and warm the brightnesses of the sun and snows, the rains and the confused beams of light had birthed forces of destruction which broke out without warning. For an extraordinary cascade of aeroliths became visible and the night was scored by dazzling lines, the stars blazed like torches, and the clouds were heralds of fire, and the moon a red brazier hurling varicolored projectiles. All things were infused with a pale light that limed the last hovels, and the glare of which, however softened, caused tremendous pain. Then the night which had opened again withdrew. From every volcano columns of ash blew into the sky, like volutes of black basalt, the pillars of a super-terrestrial world. A rain of dark dust fell backwards, and a cloud emanated from the earth, which covered the earth. And so passed the night, and the dawn was invisible. A gigantic wash of deep red coursed through the sky's embers from east to west. The atmosphere became fiery, and the air was pocked with black dots which clung to everything. The crowds lay prostrate on the ground, not knowing where to flee. The bells of the churches, convents, and monasteries chimed uncertainly, as if struck by supernatural clappers. There were, from time to time, detonations in the forts where siege cannons fired rounds of powder in an attempt to clear the air. Then, as the red globe touched the west and a day had slipped past, the general silence set in. No one had any strength left to pray, nor to beg. As the incandescent mass sunk below the black horizon, the entire western sky burst into flames and a sheet of fire retreated along the bygone route of the sun. There was an exodus before the celestial and terrestrial fires. Two poor little bodies slid along a low window and ran wildly. Despite the maculations from the rancid air, her hair was very blonde, her eyes limpid. He, golden-skinned, with a bright curtain of locks, where peculiar glints bore violet light. They knew nothing, neither one nor the other. They were hardly beyond the confines of childhood and as neighbors felt the affection of a brother and sister. And so holding each other's hand, they walked down the black streets 
where the roofs and chimneys appeared rubbed with a sinister light. Through the men laid out and the splayed, twitching horses, then on to the outer walls, the dispeopled suburbs moving to the east away from the flames. They were stopped by a river which suddenly blocked their way, whose water coursed rapidly. But there was a barge on the river bank. They pushed it off and threw themselves in, letting it go with the flood. The keel of the bark was seized by the current, its sides by the hurricane, and it shot off like a stone from a sling. It was a very old fishing barge, browned and polished from use, with paddle-worn oar locks and gunwales shiny from the passage of nets, like a primitive and honest tool of this perishing civilization. They lay themselves down deep inside, still holding each other's hand and trembling before the unknown. And the quick rowboat led them out to a mysterious sea as they fled below the hot, swirling tempest. They awoke upon a desolate ocean. Their boat was surrounded by mounds of pale algae, where the sea foam had deposited its dry slime, where iridescent creatures and pink starfish putrefied. The small waves buoyed up the white bellies of dead fish. Half the sky was veiled by the growth of the fire, which crept sensibly forth and ate away at the other half's ashen fringe. The sea appeared dead to them like everything else, for its breath was pestilent and its clarity was streaked with veins of blue and deep green. Nevertheless, the boat glided over its surface with unrelenting speed. The western horizon held bluish flickers. She dipped her hand in the water and immediately withdrew it. The waves were already hot. A dreadful seething was perhaps going to cause the ocean to quake. To the south they saw white clouds with pink aigrettes and were uncertain if this was ignited gas. The general silence and the growing fire transfixed them in a stupor. They preferred the great scream which had accompanied them, like the echo of a wheeze totalized by the wind. The far reaches of the sea where the dome of ash, still half dark, had come to plunge were opened by a gash of light. A livid blue portion of circle there seemed to promise entrance to a new world. Ah, look, she said. The wispy steam floating behind them on the ocean had just lit up with the selfsame glow as the pale and trembling sky. It was the sea aflame. Why this universal destruction? Their heads, pounding from the over-hot air, were simply filled with this multiplying question. They did not know. They were unaware of faults. Life embraced them. Suddenly they were living more quickly. Adolescence seized them amid the burning of the world. And in this ancient barge, in this first instrument of life here below, they were such a young Adam and such a little Eve, the lone survivors of this terrestrial hell. The sky was a dome of fire. Nothing remained on the horizon but a single distant blue point, over which the eyelid of fire was poised to close. They were already in the grip of a roaring sea. She stood and undressed. Naked, their pale and willowy limbs were illuminated by the universal glow. They took each other's hands and kissed. Let's fall in love, she said. That final selection is titled The Terrestrial Fire. All three of these stories come from the same collection of Marcel Schwab's work under the name The King and the Golden Mask. It was originally published in French in 1892. Marcel Schwab was born in 1867 and died in 1905. If you enjoyed hearing these stories as much as I enjoyed reading them, I would encourage you to seek out some of Schwab's work in physical form, either at your local public library or through a used bookseller. Of course, if you wind up downloading a PDF or 
buying it at a chain bookstore or an online retailer, that's fine too. It's only the end of the world. I'm Derek Swirsky. Let's talk again soon.